Jose and the Hemisphere. There's a story I want to tell. I say this to my friend Yumna during the first winter storm in San Francisco, 1990. Or rather, I imagine that I say this to her. Yumna is not actually here. I just wish she was. The story, I continue, comes from another time and a place so distant that I feel defeated before I begin. Yumna gives a quick smile and we sit in silence, ruefully contemplating the mess memory makes, especially for those whose hearts are more than one territory, more than one rainy winter day. So, she says, to make matter, matters more difficult, the story happened in Spanish, no? Translation. And the word heart has already made its appearance. Nostalgia. Nostalgia. The word nostalgia, I respond, doesn't even mean the same thing in the two languages. In English, nostalgia, acute longing for familiar surroundings. In Espanol, nostalgia, pena de verse ausente de la patria. Like the pain of finding oneself far from the patria. And even if I could translate patria into maybe homeland, this story involves individuals from at least 16 homelands, each with its own rainy winter day. I am pacing now, walking back and forth in front of a seated, if imaginary, Yuma. And both of us are aware that while the story takes place, bombs fall on Baghdad and other places just as bombs fall on Afghanistan and other places today. That while the story takes place, Jose is too. And while it is being told, he remains too. But he must be almost 19. That the story has a beginning and a middle, but two endings or none at all, and that I have no idea if I should tell it in the present or past tense, and Yumna interrupts. Just begin. So I begin. José y el hemisferio, La Habana, 1990. The flutter of white I caught in the corner of my eye distracted me from what Vilma was saying. We were sitting under the mango tree. José is at it again, I said. And sure enough, as we looked, we could see his little head peering over the balcony as he observed what he had thrown, a bra by the look of it, and how it made its way to the ground. He stayed watching until it hit, yet disappeared before a furious Etelvino wheeled out to snatch her undergarment from the grass. Jose was one of those two-year-olds who investigate the how and why of things. Since he'd arrived several months before, he'd, be, he'd been studying gravity. He would slip through open doors and grab, for example, Nestor's shoe, and out again, running full tilt up to the balcony, then throwing with all his tiny might, pulling himself up to examine the shoe's graceful arc as it sped to the ground. The snatching happened fast, yes. But the reason Jose always caught us unawares is that Jose was mute. He did not talk. He did not yell. He did not cry out. So the only detectable sounds were his bare feet slapping as he beat his retreat. Leah told us one afternoon under the mango tree how she and Oti left Jose with close friends while they flew to Havana just for two days to see doctors about Leah's fractured vertebrae. She told us how they woke up in Havana to the news. Bombs were falling on Panama. Jose quivered 48 hours under the close friend's bed, while the house shrieked and jolted. The only lights were helicopter floodlights and blue sheets that hit the wall before exploding. Lika used to say, as a kind of joke, that her son surrendered sound in Panama City, late December 1989. It took them two months to smuggle Jose to Mexico, where Oti went to meet him. 
Reunited, the family settled in a small Havana hotel where the flamboyant orange blossoms covered the green street, where we, a hemispheric quorum of Chileans, Dominicanos, Salvadorans, Argentinos, even one blue-eyed woman, del norte, from the north, made room. First day. One evening, during the year's first winter storm, we were eating in the dining hall, talking loudly to each other over the rain. Jose busied himself under the table, examining the hinge where the table lay and met the table top. Then the lights blinked out. There was no time, not even one second, between the moment when the lights blinked out and when the screams began. And they began full throttle. No preliminary whispers, no build-up, just one little boy screaming at the top of his lungs. Second ending. At some point during July's monstrous heat, Jose moved from experiments with gravity to experiments with inertia. It all started when he saw a glass fall and shatter on the floor. He saw how it didn't break into shards. It broke, like a car's windshield, into glittering globes. Jose quickly figured out that he could duplicate the trick. Reach up, take a glass, run full tilt to the mango tree, throw it with deadly force against the trunk. He did it once, twice, three times, and by then, We'd all assembled. Etelvina, Vilma, Oti, Ligia, Melania, Rufo, Rosita, Giaconda, me. Jose was standing there in silence, examining the shattered, glittering worlds at his feet. And so we stood by him, all of us. This at least we knew how to do and why. By the time I'm finished, Yumna has almost vanished. I tell her quickly that Jose learned to talk again, that the family went to Mexico City, that Ligia and Oti got their masters in environmental science, that before we lost track of each other, they sent me a Christmas photo in which they sat in a sleigh wearing winter coats. Thank you.